Hello everyone, just a very quick introduction to this video because it's a special one. In fact, it's an interview with a very special student. Uh, yeah, I'm interviewing Sylvia, who is a member of my Telegram group for Cambridge English exam students. So students who are preparing for the Cambridge English exams. And I specifically wanted to interview Sylvia because she recent, recently took the C2 proficiency Cambridge English exam and absolutely crushed it. She passed it with flying colours. In fact, she got some of the best results that I have ever seen. So I wanted to get her feedback um, on her experience with the exam itself, but also with preparation and perhaps more importantly, her general attitude to learning English, like to find out exactly how she, she managed to reach such a high level of English. So I think you're going to find this interview extremely interesting and very useful because Sylvia shares a lot of insights to the English learning process in general and some specific tips on how to pass the, the C2 proficiency Cambridge English exam, which you can really you can really use for any of the, um, the Cambridge English exams. So without any further ado, enjoy the interview. Sylvia, welcome and thank you again for, for doing this. It's very generous of you to give up your time. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I was actually really flattered to hear that you and the community were interested in hearing uh, some of my experience with the exam. Yeah, yeah. a lot of people were, were looking forward to seeing this, this interview. So uh, first of all, where are you from, Sylvia? I'm from Italy. Uh, mm -hmm. Originally, I'm from a very small town actually called Brescia, but I've been living in Milan for the last, you know, um, 11 years. Mm -hmm. And I just recently moved to uh, a new city where actually I have to learn German now. <laughs> so right. that, you know, already started, but uh, right. I have a new challenge ahead. Yeah, aiming for the C2 level in German now. That's the next objective, right? Exactly. Okay, so obviously I we're going to talk first about your... Um, your experience with the Cambridge, the C2 proficiency Cambridge English exam, because as I said, you absolutely crushed it. You passed with flying colours, as we could say. You. Uh, could you just share your results? What, what were your results exactly? So, um, should I just mention them? Um, yeah, if you say it within, for each each part of the yeah. exam, what was your score? Yeah. So for the reading, I got 230 out of 230 points, uh, use of English as well, so 230. Uh, unfortunately, the writing was a little bit my my weakness. Uh, so I got 212, which was uh, at the threshold between grade C and grade B. Uh, Terrible. <laughs> so that was kind of disappointing. <laughs> Disaster. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then listening, I had 229. And if I'm not wrong, uh, it's because I got distracted uh, on a question. So I really didn't know uh, what they said. Um, uh, and in the speaking part, I got 230 out of 230 as well. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. So just for those of you who don't know that, as, as Sylvia said, 230 is the maximum score. So two maximum scores in reading, use of English and speaking, uh, 229 in listening. So just one point off listening. Yeah. I was joking. A disaster in, in writing that most people would be extremely happy with 212 on the writing, but on the... On the results paper, on, it looks, you know, relatively, it looks, as you said, it's your weakness, but it's not, you know, for most people, it wouldn't be considered a weakness. It's interesting what you just said about the listening that you, that one point you lost because you got distracted, right? So you, you could have got maximum points there too. If you. Who knows? Maybe, yeah. maybe that's not the point where I lost uh, that one point, you know, but I remember that there was a specific part of the listening exercise since it's also the last out of mm -hmm. the whole structure of the exam where I was kind of tired and um, I, my mind started wandering uh, and I, I lost focus at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't remember exactly the exercise of whether they repeated it again, but uh, I remember that I, I had a point where I said, oh, I wasn't listening. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, the listening in all the, in the B2 first, C1 advanced and C2 proficient, they're all difficult, obviously more difficult as the levels go up. But it, as you said, it's the last paper in the exam and it's, a, you know, after a few hours, you, you you're, it's, it's exhausting and you, you will be tired, very tired by that point. And especially the last part of the listening is kind of multi, exactly. you have to do multitasking and you really have to stay focused all the time. And I say that to my students, you just, at that point, you just have to keep reminding yourself, stay focused, stay focused, stay focused. It's, it's very easy to, 
to get distracted at that point. I think it's a little bit cruel of Cambridge to put listening as the last part because if you if you lose your focus or get distracted in the reading, you can you should go back and read that and sentence or that paragraph again. But the listening, you do you always have two opportunities to listen, but the the audio will always be repeated. But you need those two opportunities, especially in part four, because if you if you miss something the second time, it's very difficult to get both answers. But but as I said, just to, to, to drop one point on the listening is is incredible anyway. So as I said, that's why I wanted to speak to you, because I think viewers to this video will get a lot from hopefully be inspired and motivated by your experience, because um, to, to show that it can be done. And we'll, we'll speak about the writing later because it's it's interesting. It does stand out because it is lower than the others, but um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But what I wanted to know, I want to get your, your experience and your tips. So this is quite a general question, but how did you do it? How did you get, <laughs> how did you pass with such, such flying colors? That's a very good question. Um, so I, you know, I don't have a definite answer, but I can share with you a little bit how, how my preparation went. And especially, you know, I, I think that what's interesting is that I started watching your videos about 10 days a week before I was supposed to take the exam. Right. So that was very late. Yeah. Um, and so I started watching them compulsively. So I, I, I kept on watching videos at any time of the day while I was brushing my teeth and anything so <laughs> just to kind of learn about the structure of the exam and mm -hmm. get uh, as much uh, information as possible um, and you know um, to me that was very uh, important because um, even though you know the time was very short and I heard one of your videos where you said um, you should start preparing at least two months in advance mm -hmm. if not even three four or yeah. more uh, and then I was really panicking and I thought, wow, I screwed, I screwed this up completely. <laughs> it's too late for me, uh, especially because a few years ago I took the TOEFL exam mm -hmm. um, and I hadn't prepared at all for the exam because I just thought, you know, I know English, so I'm just going to go there, take the exam and get my result. Um, and then I learned, I realized that you have to get acquainted with the structure of the exam mm -hmm. a little bit in advance. So that's mm -hmm. why this time I tried a little bit uh, to, to get acquainted with the structure more than just learning it by heart. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a little bit my approach. I followed a lot of YouTube videos, mostly yours, uh, I have to say. <laughs> uh, I've listened to other videos as well from mm -hmm. other speakers, but I have to say, um, I realized that sometimes the advice they gave was not uh, perfect. So I I also did a work of selection and mm -hmm. filtering in terms of what kind of content I got my advice from, uh, because I think mostly for the reading and speaking parts, um, you know, you, you have to, you know, screen out things that are, that may give you advice that make you uncomfortable or maybe mm. don't make you sound so natural or, you know, uh, yeah. things like that. Yeah. So yeah, that, that was mostly my preparation. And then I bought the book, uh, the CPE proficiency that you suggested. Mm -hmm. And I uh, did all the exercises in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, so, right. uh, you know, a little time, but uh, I, I focused all my efforts on it. Pretty intense, intense study. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. intense. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that really helped me in the use of English part, mostly. That mm. was the part that scared me the most because I always felt like I'm not very creative. Mm -hmm. And in the use of English, sometimes you have to come up with a word. Um, and, you know, that takes a little bit of creativity to me right. uh, to kind of imagine the word in context. Uh, eventually, it was a little bit easier than I had expected, because I think the text really gives you a lot of hints to fill out the right word. And that's something I learned from the videos. So really, like, look at the words that precede the, the, the void and the words that follow it. Um, that was a good technique. So I think, you know, videos and preparation courses in general kind of give mm -hmm. you techniques mm -hmm. um, that, that can be very crucial uh, in, you know, attaining, I would say, the, the perfect score. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because that obviously you have a very good level of English. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to pass the exam at all if not, but to get those scores. But it is a lot about knowing the format and knowing a strategy for each part of the exam. That's what I repeat a lot. You need to know exactly what you're going Absolutely. to 
how to approach each part of the exam. And yeah, that video you mentioned where I say you need two months, that's, I think I say in that video, I'm not sure, but um, it is possible in less than two. In fact, I think I say it's possible in less than a month, but doing it as you did it quite intensively, you have to sort of um, do all the parts of the exam at least once, you know, take sample papers and, and do it all and really get, get an idea for a strategy. So yeah, that that's, I think that's a good example. You, you've done it. Most or many people don't have that opportunity to do it, you know, in, in a week or 10 days. It's, it's not, it's possible, but it's not advisable, but you are the exception that, that proves the rule. I think that you, you've, you've been able to do it. Um, so it's amazing that you, you, you were able to get such a high score and, and I think the conclusion we come to is that you have to watch all my videos, right? That's the, the right. <laughs> and I can give hope to everybody because apparently, you know, you can prepare for it even if you're watching this video very late in your preparation. Good. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. It's one of them. Somebody actually made a comment on that that very video actually the other day. Somebody who I think they passed the C one and they got a very good score and, and it's very similar to you. I think they prepared in ten days, and they wanted to make it clear that. You can, it, and I hope my video doesn't sort of scare or, or demotivate people. It, it's the idea is the opposite, but it's just to prepare people realistically. And um, but it, it can be done, and you you are the proof of that. So um, so excellent. So I mean, you mentioned a few tips there. I mean, I was I was joking about my videos. There are many other YouTubers, but yeah, you do have to be kind of selective and be careful. There are some very good ones out there, but um. But also, yeah, preparation courses. Um, the people that, that holds true for anything. I mean, yeah. you have to know who you're trusting in your preparation, obviously, and know that they're prepared. So, yeah, yeah, you need to. It's it's difficult because if you don't know the exam, that's something I didn't ask you. By the way, have you ever taken or had you ever taken a, a Cambridge English exam before you took the proficiency? No, no? just the TOEFL. Yeah. Right, so that was your first yeah, experience with the Cambridge. Cambridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because that's another thing. If if if, for example, a student wants to prepare for the C two proficiency and they they have already taken the C one advanced quite recently, then that that's a good preparation because the the format is very similar. There are yeah, differences, that's a good point. but but yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously you just have a good um, a good attitude and good approach to to studying so can you give us any other tips for, for students i mean you mentioned a few there but any other um any other tips that you feel, felt that really helped you and could help others um sure i, I mean there's different tips for different parts of the exam to me mm -hmm. so on the one hand uh, as as i said previously i think um preparation is one thing and getting acquainted with the format uh, another completely different story is uh, your level of English. So to me, the, the approach was I'm certifying my level of English and mm -hmm. I just want to get the best result possible. But I chose specifically the exam that I felt was right for my um, for my level. So that, that I think that kind of played a role mm -hmm. there. But in terms of exam tips and preparation tips, so uh, I was kind of uh, afraid of the speaking part because even though I speak English quite, you know, um, I would say almost on a daily basis, um, I'm not a native speaker and most of the time I don't have the opportunity to speak to native speakers mm -hmm. and that kind of scared me because um, uh, in particular I having to speak to someone else during the exam was uh, you know something an unknown I would say so mm -hmm. uh, eventually you you were not going to know in advance what they're going to say whether they're going to be um, proactive and you know ask you questions or whether they're just going to take up all of your time. Mm -hmm. And actually what was funny for me was that we were three, mm -hmm. instead uh, of two people at the uh, exam. So that was, you know, when I, when I realized that I was even more uh, anxious about <laughs> having yeah. the speaking test with three people because it can be difficult to interrupt. Uh, and I watched your video on interrupting, mm -hmm. uh, oh, but you. you know, um, so uh, it is still a social situation that can somehow influence the way that you approach the speaking test. Um, and eventually one of the participants was um, speaking a lot. So it was very hard to intervene and, right. and say something about that. Um, but um, I think that's also something that got me the results uh, that I got because um, I, I really tried to think, well, this is my chance to um, show that I have a good 
level of English and that I'm also able to somehow interact in a very natural uh, situation. So I did my best to try and say, wait, uh, can I just jump in really quickly to add something or yeah. um, just, you know, trying to agree, trying to signal that I, I could add something on top of the conversation. And at the same time, I also tried not to make the same mistake. So it kind of, you know, uh, motivated me to pass on uh, the, the, the conversation towards the third speaker, who was then a little bit more you know she was a bit shyer and uh had some more trouble in you know right. jumping into into uh the conversation so eventually i think that that approach and also the challenge uh was uh very beneficial in terms of the results because the instructor uh was able to see that i could handle some how the conversation that's you know i would really suggest everybody to remember that it's your exam it's your chance to shine yeah. Um, and it's important to to you know intervene and not be shy and try to be proactive. Excellent. Yeah. Um, yes. In terms of other parts, uh, um, so for example, the listening, the most difficult part to me was the last one, where different mm -hmm. people speak about different subjects in a very messy way. So I think preparation was crucial because if I hadn't uh, tried the exercises beforehand, then I would have never had the opportunity to uh, focus on the right uh, contents that I actually had to uh, answer questions for mm -hmm. and things like that. So, um, you know, for, in the listening, especially, as you said, you don't have the chance to go back and re mm -hmm. uh, revise whatever the content was. So uh, to me, it was super, super uh, important and uh, it was instrumental to have watched videos and uh, the, all of the preparation in terms of exercises um, and for example for that I dedicated an entire day so I, I kind of used the parts in I, I approached the parts in silos so I dedicated each day to a different part uh, yeah. of the exam so that I could just focus completely on that part and immerse myself in the um, in a yeah in that specific that task yeah that, yeah that's very interesting I, I think it's quite handy that you know you have five parts of the exam. I mean, it's the reading and use of English. I think we can separate the reading and use of English as two parts. And you just do Monday reading, Tuesday use of English, Wednesday listening, Thursday writing, Friday speaking, if you if you can. And then at the weekend, maybe whatever, learn, study some grammar. That's kind of handy to do it that way. And it, it's very a very simple way of organizing your time. And obviously that, that was beneficial and, to you. I think the different parts are not very synergic, so it's um, very distracting and it requires you a lot of setup time to go from one part to the other during the same day. Obviously, that's what you have to do on the exam date, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I, I think it's an unnecessary uh, effort that you mm -hmm. have to make if you just go through the entire exam mm -hmm. the same day. It's mm -hmm. better to focus uh, and to get really to the core of what the exercises are and mm -hmm. get very, I mean, become very um, skilled at the exercise itself before you pass on and learn a new kind of exercise. That right. was a little bit yeah. my, my experience with that. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah. It's a, obviously, you are a very organized person, very structured, and that, that's very important for this, this uh, type of exam, I think. I mean, Apart from having the level, I, I'm an engineer, as, yeah. I, as I told you before. <laughs> yeah. I'm an engineer, so maybe exactly. that's, that's why. Yeah, I think. Yeah, we spoke a little about that. That your um, you you. I think it, that particularly helps that being an engineer for the, your exam preparation. I think you again. You you need the the level of English in general, but to be able to organize your preparation, especially in such little time, because I mean. If you had more time, sometimes I mean we always say that the more time you have to prepare, the better. But if you have little time to, there's a law called Parkinson's law, I think, where you, the time you have for completing a yeah, task, the more you, time you have, yeah, the, the, the more time you're dead. What is it exactly? Yeah. The, the more time you, yeah, the, the you more have, you take. Yeah, yeah exactly. So if ten days, you just have to do it intensively. Maybe what you would do you'd normally do in six months. So, yeah, that. The task fills the time that you have to do it. So if you have six months, you probably end up doing the same as you would do in ten days because you just have to do it intensely. It's a guess. Yeah, it just expands in the in the time window you have at your disposal. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Yeah. So, but it's very very interesting your your the way you organize it. Just going back to what you were saying about um, 
the speaking because it's interesting you're in a group of three um and and also it's interesting that you had a, a partner who spoke one partner who spoke a lot and another partner who spoke very little that's a, a big and it sounds like you did this very well you have to be flexible you have to be prepared for whatever situation and be prepared to be assertive if necessary not not rude not um, aggressive but assertive to interrupt and take your as you said to take your opportunity it's your exam it's your time um, but also to include your partner i think i agree with you when i think the examiners must have noticed that and appreciated yeah, they that did. yeah that's why you but got they the, also noticed uh, that it was a difficult situation so that's also you know something that you may consider yeah. Yeah, maybe that you you made that work to your advantage. The fact that it was a difficult situation. Some people may have just panicked and and kind of um, shied away from it, but you you were proactive and you, and you you used it to your advantage. So you were able to demonstrate. It's all about demonstrating your level. And at the C two proficiency level, it's about being able to deal with these situations and um and communicate in a, an effective way of, you know, interaction. I mean, in that part of the exam, it's all about interaction and, and at your level, that's what they're looking for, your ability to, to be flexible. And that's why you got maximum scores for speaking, which is, which is really difficult. It's, um, um, yeah, I think, I think they wouldn't expect somebody to just, uh, come up and start a monologue and start speaking for, you know, a few minutes. That's not what, what they are looking for, no. I guess. No, uh, and that was also yeah. something that the other students then understood that and they mm. were uh, speaking a little bit too long and mm. that kind of helped, you know, the other candidate as well to realize the mistakes that they were making yeah. and continue in a different way, I would say. Yeah, that's something. Yeah. I. I I think it's very important to help your part, your partner or partners. You probably don't really care what what results, what score your partner gets, but it, it's beneficial for you to help your partners. And again, the examiners will recognize that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think also, I mean, you mentioned the, the listening, especially the last part and the speaking. You, you, and you really benefited or you you understood how much you benefited from preparation it's it's incredible that some people take the i can't imagine even as a native speaker taking the the c2 proficiency cambridge english exam without any preparation i can't imagine for example the part four of the listening turning the page and trying to understand what i have to do and what approach to take in a few seconds before the audio starts it's just it, it's not impossible but i mean it's it, I think it's impossible to get maximum score without any preparation because it's even for a native speaker, it would be very, very tricky. And the point is also time management. So um, it, it, the tight is it, the time is very tight. So mm. the timing is very tight to, mm. uh, you know, to to do all the exercises in such short and paced uh, mm -hmm. slots of time. So yeah. for me, uh, the preparation was also crucial for. Uh, I would say dedicating the right time to the right, uh, you know, the right amount of time to each of the parts of the exam. Obviously, in listening, that's not the case because time is managed. But you know, you you still don't have that much time or infinite attempts to listen to the yeah. conversation. So you know what to you have to know what to expect before you you get there. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean you mentioned time management, and that's really. Most important for the um, reading and use of English, um, and also the writing. But um, so, what was your approach to the reading and use of English regarding time management? So I uh, I don't remember exactly uh, each part of the exam. I have to be honest because I took the exam three months ago and then I forgot everything about it. <laughs> <Somewhat>. uh, <laughs> celebrating. Yeah. Yeah. Put until out, I got the results, mind. not really, but yeah. Then celebrating. Uh, but I have to say, I watched one of your videos about uh, how to approach uh, the exercises and I structured it exactly that way. So I think I, it went backwards for me. Mm -hmm. um, and that advice was very important for uh, the reading and use of English because I ended up with probably the first exercise uh, of the use of English uh, uh, with very little time mm. but luckily it was an easy exercise because I think it was the, um, the exercise where you had to convert words uh, or you know something like that so um, 
you know, that just following the advice of somebody who was experiencing exam preparation was mm -hmm. very important in that sense. And I recommend everybody to watch that video <laughs> and, and do exactly the same because unfortunately the last exercises are the ones that are most uh, time uh, intensive, you mm -hmm. know, uh, time consuming, I would say. So um, that, that was very important for me. Yeah, it's, I think just for the, those people who were well, very quickly to explain that idea is that the first four exercises, well, the first three tasks are, the first is multiple choice, part one is multiple choice, then it's um, a, a gap-filled um, task, and yeah, then it's word it's transformation. It's time-consuming as well. Yeah. yeah, but you can do those. The, the multiple choice, if you only have two minutes left, for example, you can do that in two minutes. You can't do parts five, six, and seven in two minutes. You, you have a lot to read and you need need to dedicate time to it. So that's why it's a good idea to start with either in five, six, seven, in this order, five, six, seven, four, three, two, one, or you said maybe you started with seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. That's I remember I followed the, the advice you gave, so okay. I, I don't remember exactly, but I remember it, I, I had to go to the end of the test and then right. yeah. go a little bit backwards. So yeah, it some, five, six, seven. And, yeah. yeah, some people feel a bit uh, uncomfortable doing that because, they, you know, they, uh, one of my students in my exam academy, um, I'll put the link in the, the description to that, to, um, to this video, but um, they said that they followed my advice and that they uh, Agreed, it's good, a good tip, good advice, but she felt a bit nervous or intimidated at first because most of the other students were starting with part one. So they're just writing and turning the page quite quickly while she was still on part five. Uh, but it, so it may be a little bit disconcerting. I don't know if that ha happened to you when you hear other people that they seem to be, well, they are going more quickly, but obviously they would be going when they hit part five six and seven they would have to slow down and it's um yeah i had the same experience so we yeah. were just four uh and i i looked at all of them and none of them started from the from the back so none of them right. turned the page immediately and i was surprised but i i kept my confidence i kept confident and i continued on to the the last part and when the time was about to end i heard them you know uh, panicking about uh having timing issues and uh, yeah, so I, I think the strategy was successful, you know, yeah. and uh, most people maybe haven't watched videos or haven't heard that, haven't believe. gotten the advice. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So there are still some people who haven't watched my videos. That's incredible. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> no, it's um, obviously, yeah, I, I, other people give, I'm not the only person, the only teacher that gives that advice. I think it's, uh, it, but it's, it is, it, you, you are proof that it, it works. So it's, that's what I. That's why I like to speak to students because it's easy for me to give advice. I've never taken the exam. I don't have to take the exam. My advice is from experience teaching students and getting their feedback over years. Um, but you, your experience is, is and your your feedback is so valuable to me and and to all these students, of course. Um, one thing I did want to say with the speaking, um, because your speaking is obviously very good. You speak very well and. But this is an important thing. You do, you have a very slight accent, so you, you don't, and I think some people, and you got maximum scores in the speaking, and this is, you don't, it's a good opportunity to, to emphasize that you don't need to speak with a perfect British or American accent to, to, yeah. to get maximum scores. I mean, you speak, your, your accent is, is very good. You, you don't, make uh thank you pretty, well, <laughs> sorry I, I didn't want to say accent because i love i love all accents even very strong accents and your pronunciation is very good i should say and that's what's key it's so you can have an accent um but as long as your pronunciation is, is intelligible then you can get maximum scores so right yeah yeah, yeah. I, I also always try not to force it because mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I felt intimidated, uh, a little intimidated when I watched a few videos that I found around uh, mm -hmm. by the the accent and uh, that, that people had. But then I mm -hmm. realized that maybe they made mistakes anyway. So mm -hmm. it was just uh, um, that's what you would maybe call window dressing, you know, just mm -hmm. pretend that you have a very nice accent and then still make some mistakes that, that can happen, I guess. 
so I, I took the opposite approach. I adopted the opposite approach. And I said, okay, I'm just going to go, you know, full disclosure. Obviously, I'm not a native speaker. Otherwise, I wouldn't be taking the exam. Nobody yeah. is expecting me to be to speak like a native speaker, even exactly. though I'm, I'm here for the C2 level. Um, and so I, I, I hope that I can give hope to everybody that even <laughs> though you don't have the perfect accent or perfect pronunciation, that it can still can still work as long as people and especially I, I would say your partners uh, in the speaking um, understand what you what you say because somehow you have to interact mm -hmm. and yeah you have to make yourself intelligible also to to those mm -hmm. um, so yeah to, to them so so that was that was a, uh, an important thing uh, yeah but uh, initially I was intimidated yeah I, I, yeah it's I, good yeah. it's good that you say that because I think other people may feel that um but I agree with you. Some people focus on improving their accent, not improving their accent, uh, but trying to speak like a native speaker. And that's like learning to run before you can walk. I think sometimes you sh some of those students should be focusing on their vocabulary and grammar before they try to speak like the Queen of England. It's, uh, that's, <laughs> and it sounds unnatural anyway. I, I, it's very obvious when some people are trying to force their accent. It's, it should just develop naturally. And I love French accents. I love Italian accents. I love um, all the German accents, uh, all the Spanish accents. They're all. I, I love all accents. I think accents are part of our personality and, and character. So, and and it's the same. The Cambridge exams accept all accents as long as your pronunciation is intelligible. We do, we do need to speak briefly about the writing because that was your lowest score. Quite as I said, it stands out because it was only 212 again for most people that would be and it is for you it's fun, a fantastic score but why do you think it was lower than the others I, I was surprised i have to say because the writing didn't scare me as much maybe that's also why i wasn't so motivated to practice it i have to admit that i haven't written any text before the exam uh, maybe that was a mistake, but I, I'm, I'm a researcher, so I have to write academic papers all mm -hmm. the time. Um, and I, I somehow, yeah, I, I thought, well, this is what I do on a daily basis. Obviously, I write academic papers in English. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was a little bit superficial, maybe, in the preparation for that mm -hmm. part, uh, especially because uh, I watched a lot of videos and I realized that there are certain standard uh, structures that are mm. expected to, um, to 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 organize the text around, I would say. Um, and so I, I tried to learn those. Mm. Uh, and I, in my head, I had decided I would go for a report uh, because that's what most um, looked like, what I'm used to writing mm -hmm. in my uh, academic experience. Um, but eventually there was no a chance for a report so uh -huh. the only report that was available was uh, related to the set texts mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't have time to to read the set texts mm -hmm. and actually I looked for the the series that was connected to the set text but it was unavailable in my country there was some technical problems and with such short uh, time to prepare then I decided not to devote my efforts towards looking for the set text and reading it but right. um, I, I decided to, to to focus on something else. So I had to end up with a, let's say, second choice in terms of um, type of uh, piece of writing that I would write. Mm -hmm. um, the topics were not very uh, attractive to me, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, there was one about fashion that I chose in the, in the first part. And um, yeah, so that was you know, a little bit, I, I wasn't very creative. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't know what to say. Right. Uh, my exam was paper-based. I think this is very important to say. So I was also a little bit anxious about time management um, because, you know, handwriting takes a lot of time and mm -hmm. you don't have so many opportunities to, uh, I would say, delete uh, your text. So, you know, uh, th that kind of uh, made it very difficult for me. Yeah. Uh, so if I could go back, honestly, I would uh, maybe write a little bit more to exercise, um, and I would I would probably read the set texts. Even though if you have a limited amount of time, I'm not sure it's the right investment to make. Um, yeah, I think I think watching the series or the film, I think at the moment the set texts for those of you who don't know what we're talking about in the c2 proficiency you have the option for the writing to to read 
two books or, or you can read one or both books or none of the books it just gives you extra options in part two of the speaking uh, but you need to you would need to read those books beforehand and obviously if your time is limited but they they, they always choose books which have either book or series adapt uh, sorry a film or series adaptation so that that often is is enough but again if you don't have or you can't just can't find um, the series or you're not able to watch it then it's it's a problem but yeah I think writing if you're pressed for time writing is the one area which is the most difficult to to practice also because you it's difficult to get feedback if you don't have a an experienced teacher to give you feedback on on your tasks so um, that's tough but but you still got a very good score but um, it's a pity that they don't give you any feedback because you just get the the score you don't get the you don't know why yeah. or how how you could have improved your, and your which, score. which part was the the worst uh, also that's that's not information they share but you know I, I was kind of surprised because it's my daily job and mm. normally um, I get good feedback about my writing so um, I also have to edit my own text and so on yeah. so I, I normally get good feedback but it's a very specific kind of writing and mm. I think that's that's also a problem so um, you you can't really um, you have to choose the right register and the right format and so on so I'm not uh, used to writing dissemination articles for example or blog posts or whatever so yeah. that uh, that could have been part of my issue you know maybe some word choice or yeah I think it, with a C2 proficiency in particular that as you said the register is very important you have to take into consideration the target reader so the part one there are two parts in the writing part one is the essay it's compulsory this and that's always the same register part two you have an option and you have different options but you have to decide or you have to use a register which is suitable depending on the target reader um, and that's it can be a little bit with a c2 proficiency it's a little bit vague who the target reader is so you know with practice but again you got a good score i mean you got yeah you just said on the borderline of b so that's that's it's excellent but compared to your other scores it it's notably lower but um you passed so <laughs> but yeah i think it's speaking and writing are the most difficult skills to um to prepare for the exam in in short notice but speaking um you did very well obviously and it's be i mean this is something i wanted to speak about moving on a little bit from the exam i mean what are your to to, to reach the level you have the pr proficiency level what do you do you have a sort of da daily habits or daily do you do you include english in your routine daily routine or da daily habits so yeah uh, thanks for the question because i think it's probably the most important part of the of the preparation a as i said I, I would say it's a completely different um, yeah um, component of your uh or, or, or driver for your uh, for your score eventually because um i uh, I have to say I work most of the time in uh, using English. So mm -hmm. most of my colleagues are um, international. So that they come from different countries. They're not native speakers. That's uh, uh, that, that that's an important point. I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and on a daily basis, I try to um, read or listen to as much content as possible. That's in its original language, whatever it is. But mostly, obviously. Um, also in terms of my interests uh, and um, it's it's English so I listen to a lot of podcasts uh, and mostly uh, about also technical mm -hmm. um, topics so I'm very passionate about uh, theoretical physics so I listen to podcasts on right. that <laughs> okay. or neuroscience uh, or right. so um, you know still maybe the register is kind of academic that could be an mm -hmm. issue for some uh, but then I, I would say that I am supplemented with a lot of conversation with uh, with you know people who can only communicate in english so that's mm -hmm. a, that's a good mix i would say i watch series in english all the time right. uh, on a daily basis read books uh, and since i'm a researcher i also read papers uh, mm -hmm. academic papers in right. english uh, and attend conferences presented conferences so wow you know it has to be entrenched in your daily life if you really want to excel at c2 i think you can 
probably still get C2, even though you don't really conduct uh, your life partly in English. But um, this uh, anything is really helpful if you are really yeah. immersed in the language. Yeah, very, very interesting and, and very uh really useful insights into how to just not just pass the exams but to reach a, a very high level of english it's about making it part of your life and you know if you if you have to work with english it, it helps too because i always talk about having a variety of different inputs because yeah you have your academic but you have more well, your work and more academic style um or type of input but you also have you, i guess you have to speak to your colleagues sometimes just make small talk not always about yeah, right. work yeah and and with the series and books and, and just reading and obviously you're interested in i mean do you enjoy learning english do you enjoy the do you have a good relationship with english uh, absolutely right. ever since i was a kid I, I got used to that so i always watched uh, english cartoons uh, and attended uh, study holidays things like that and i always really enjoyed it uh, I think the attitude is a very important part of it. If you hate yeah. it, then it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, especially because you need attention. So uh, to listen to a five-hour podcast about uh, the structure of the universe, you have to <laughs> yeah. pay attention. Yeah. Uh, and if you're not interested in it. But that's also some advice that you gave in one of your videos. And I found that that really resonated, that you have to do things you enjoy mm -hmm. uh, in the language. So whatever it is, you know. That that applies to me too. That, yeah, really that, that that tip is it because I also give the opposite tip because I I, I think yeah for ge learning English in general you it you have to enjoy the process I think like anything I mean any hobby you have you become an expert on that that area because you you just enjoy it you you like if you really like music you become an expert on music if you like wine then you become an expert on wine it's the same with English. But I also say for specifically exam tips is that you kind of have to force yourself to read or, or listen to things you wouldn't normally yeah, read or listen I, yeah, to. Yeah, now I remember. Yeah, and <laughs> I really thought about my podcasts because that, you know, even though I enjoy the, them, they help you focus a lot because podcasts are just like the listening exercise. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Because I think watching series is excellent, but there are visuals which which help you, which it, that's real, but. That's real life. I mean, body language, facial expressions, and but with a podcast, it's just exclusively listening. So I, I, there, that's a great idea. And it's very easy because I listen to them while I'm driving. So if I have a long drive, uh, I just put on a podcast. Or if I'm cleaning or you know doing some chores yeah. around the house, that's just you know it's my uh, white noise, you know, my background. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it forces you to develop some kind of focus mm -hmm. on what's being said without getting any other uh, cues. Uh, so that, I think that has been instrumental for my preparation as well, Good. for the exam yeah. preparation. Podcasts, yeah, huge. We're, again, we're so lucky nowadays that we have all these resources. It's not, you know, 30 years ago, it was just a, an exercise book with a, I was going to say a CD, but yeah, CD or a, t a cassette or something. Um, now we have so many so many options we can't complain just to, to we're coming to the end now but i i a few months ago well actually it was one of my first videos but i i remade it more recently it was i made a video where i i speak about an acronym i invented with three letters and each letter represents an adjective that i think um kind of sums up what a good english learner is the character you know the, the a, a, a trait or a feature of a, a good English learner. Um, I'm not going to tell you what my adjectives are. I don't know if you've seen that video, but I, I was wondering if you have... I haven't, I'll be honest. Yeah. Okay, no problem. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you mine and then you can perhaps think about yours. And my, my three were proactive, inquisitive, and patient. So the, the acronym is PIP, to be PIP. So proactive, inquisitive, and patient. Uh, so I think that pretty much uh, you could argue there are more um, and it's quite general, but I think in my experience as a teacher, the really good students are always proactive. They're always looking for opportunities to speak and practice. They're inquisitive. They're always asking me questions or asking themselves questions. Or when they see a film or reading a book, they're always analyzing 
and not always, I don't want to say always, but often they're, they're thinking about the grammar, they're asking questions about the grammar, the vocabulary, the pronunciation. And patient, because it's a long process and, and it takes time. So I think that's that kind yeah. of sums it up. Do you would you do you have any others any other adjectives to add to that or I mean, I, I identify myself in those adjectives. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought about a uh, few um, adjectives. The acronym doesn't sound very good, so I'm not going to say it. But <laughs> okay. uh, so I, I would say, I, so I, I also think, you know, curiosity is a very important yeah. uh, characteristic because you need to be willing to look for for content so i always thought that a new language is a new window that opens onto a world of content of you know experiences uh and if you're not curious you're just not going to have the motivation and mm -hmm. that's sufficient to to really immerse yourself in in a given language so for me it was movies podcasts anything i was very curious to learn about things that were at the frontier of a certain uh domain i would say mm. uh, and therefore my curiosity kind of pushed me to uh, improve 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 mm. my, my yeah. language skills yeah. uh, open-mindedness for sure mm -hmm. um so i i i it's worth mentioning that i had flatmates from different countries and friends from different countries so being very open-minded and trying to make friends with as many people from different mm -hmm. cultures as possible really helped me in language learning uh, in particular in English, because you will meet a lot more people who are not native speakers than those who are. And, you know, just being very open-minded and trying to speak to as many as you can, I think is, is very important for, for the development of the language and learning. And this somehow building up this uh, language proficiency that you really need for the, in this case, the CTO exam. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last one I would say is consistency. Uh, mm. So um, you have to continue learning the language. So you can't just drop it and then go back to it and, uh, you know, take the exam. It has yeah. to be, as, a, as I said, entrenched, intertwined in whatever you're doing, because right. um, I'm, I'm learning other languages as well. Um, and I have to say, I realize that you forget them very easily if you mm. don't use them uh, on a... It doesn't need to be a daily basis, but it needs to be very often. So I would yeah. say consistency. Don't just drop the the original language in a series because you're too tired. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it, yeah. It, it's uh, it's a matter of laziness, maybe I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, but it's just easy to make the easy choice uh, to mm -hmm. drop it. Uh, but uh, I, to me, it's very important to be consistent, just like sports. You know, the mm -hmm. more you do it, also the the easier it gets. So. Uh, after a uh, few months that you just watch original language series, for example, or listen to podcasts, it will just become natural. So, yeah, yeah. but I'm not going to say the acronym. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, COC, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, we could maybe put it together with mine, uh, cockpit yeah. or pip. Yeah, maybe it's... Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think I agree with all, all of what you said. Definitely, of course. I mean... Uh, I couldn't disagree because you are an example of an excellent student and your English is better than my Spanish and I'm, I have experience as a teacher, but as I've said, I think the student's perspective is so much more important in many, many ways. So I think that's, that's excellent. Um, yeah, the consistency thing I think is very important. As you mentioned sports, and I think yeah, that there are so many an analogies with sports, with doing exercise, keeping fit. You, and I've mentioned that in in other videos. So I think that's anybody that does do exercise, running or, or going regularly to the gym, can relate that to English learning process. And it's again, it's it's continuous. There's no sort of destination it's just something you you maintain all your life so in maintaining some the habits and, and a relationship with english in some ways it doesn't have to be intense or preparing for an exam continuously it's just keep making it and keeping it a part of your life so so excellent Absolutely. uh i think we i think that was so useful sylvia i think so many useful insights regarding the exam but also in general so i really appreciate it i really appreciate you being so generous with your time um no problem it was a pleasure really i hope i can help some fellow learners i think you uh, in the future definitely and, and i'm looking forward to seeing in the comments on these videos if anybody has anything to to add or, or to ask um 
So yeah, thank you again and uh, we'll keep in touch, Sylvia. So thank you. Thank you for the invitation.